Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 217. We're going to mix it up a little bit in this episode, kind of do away with the standard format, because I have something that I think that you and I need to talk about. So we're going to be doing that in this episode. We're going to be exploring one of the hot topics in the news of late, which is an arrest in the case of the Golden State Killer. Now, what does this have to do with genealogy? Well, of course, it touches on the area of genetic genealogy, because that's how they found their man. But by using genetic genealogy and some of the databases that are out there, it has brought up a lot of questions, and actually questions that have been kind of simmering under the surface, but it's time for them to be looked at and addressed. So in this episode, what I want to do is just have a one-on-one conversation with you and talk about how this case has unfolded, what the ramifications are of it, and what does it mean for you in your own genealogy research, and specifically in regards to DNA testing. And of course, DNA testing has been on fire in the last couple of years in the genealogy community, and it really hasn't been (laughs) explored too much. It really hasn't had the surface scratched to ask some of the questions that float around it, and surround it. And to a certain extent, this is kind of the Wild West. These are the pioneering years of genetic genealogy. And we're finding that we're not in this alone. Other people, for many different other reasons, have an interest in our DNA results and in our family trees. So sit back and relax, and let's give this some thought and have some conversation. You may or may not agree with everything I say. Doesn't matter. The whole idea here is is that we are opening the door to questions and looking for some of the answers. And whether you choose to have your DNA tested, whether you've already done it, or whether you think you will never do it, the important thing is to go into this topic with your eyes wide open. And when you do make your decision, it's an informed decision. And so that's what I want to do today, here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. As a child growing up in Northern California in the mid-1970s, I enjoyed riding my banana seat bike freely about the neighborhood with my friends, dropping my allowance on candy at the nearby stop and go, and generally having safe, free run of our neighborhood until dark each day. But by the mid-1970s, a series of house ransackings in the Visalia area, just south of Fresno, had started up, and the culprit quickly earned the moniker, the Visalia Ransacker. Then eastern Sacramento middle-class neighborhoods fell prey to a series of more vicious crimes of rape, sending fear throughout the community. The perpetrator operated solely in Sacramento County from the first attacks in June 1976 until May 1977. After a three-month gap, he struck in nearby San Joaquin County before returning to Sacramento for all but one of the next 10 attacks. The rapist attacked five times during the summer of 1978 in nearby counties before disappearing again for three months. Soon after, a series of attacks hit the area around Danville, California. It's an area known as the East Bay because it's just east of San Francisco Bay Area. This was in October of 1978, and it lasted until July of 1979. This criminal at large was aptly named the East Bay Rapist. After a failed rape attempt again in Danville, the East Area Rapist went silent. But soon, Southern California was hit with its first in a series of murders of what became known as the original Night Stalker. All the sprees resulted, at a minimum, in 12 murders, more than 50 rapes, and over 100 burglaries in California from 1974 through 1986. 
The modus operandi, the MO, of each of these criminals was distinctive and consistent, which helped investigators eventually tie many of the crime scenes to one man and together. Unfortunately, definitive tools like DNA were not yet available, and the man who had wreaked havoc across the state and was now known as the Golden State Killer remained at large. Over time, the police gathered a lot of information about him, though not a name. They believed he was white, male, about 5'10", slender and athletic. He had type A blood, wore a size 9 shoe, and was, they thought, in his early 20s when the rapes began in 1976. It was this MO that led some investigators to believe that these differently labeled criminals were very likely one and the same. But it wasn't until 2001 that DNA definitively linked several rapes in Contra Costa County, believed to have been part of the East Area Rapist Series, to a series of murders in Southern California. In 2001, DNA evidence proved that the Domingo Sanchez murders were committed by the same man, now known as the Golden State Killer. I've always had an interest in this case because I was born in nearby Stockton and I had relatives in Sacramento. It was a sweet, all-American type of place to live. You didn't lock your doors. You rode your bikes around unsupervised until dinner. But by the time the Golden State Killer had begun his reign of terror, my family had already moved out of the area to another state. So we had only heard about it in the news and through relatives. So in 2016, I was glad to hear that the FBI released further information related to the crimes, including new composite sketches and victim and investigator testimonies. They held a press conference in Sacramento, and the local and FBI law enforcement agencies announced a $50,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of the Golden State Killer and a national database to help law enforcement manage the investigation and handle the tips that they hoped would flood in. A few weeks ago, Bill and I were watching the documentary series called The Golden State Killer. It's not over. The series carefully laid out what was known about the case. Their goal? Generate new leads through the media attention and bring him to justice. As we watched, I kept telling Bill, you know, genetic genealogy can absolutely solve this. The scenario was simple. All you'd have to do is submit a sample of the DNA investigators already had on file to a service like Ancestry DNA under an anonymous username, which would in turn, over time, generate DNA matches. Eventually, one of those matches would have a tree, although even if they didn't, they could still locate a tree for that match. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Once you have a tree for the closest DNA match, you can then search the tree for the MO. Males born in the 1940 to 1955 range, and even if the person was listed as living with no other information, look for one who was from a family from the California area. Now, clearly, there was a problem with this method because there have been issues over privacy and law enforcement serving warrants to genealogy companies in the past. It's been murky water and very new territory for the whole DNA industry, although investigators have been requesting and issuing subpoenas for data like phone records for years. But with today's public genealogy databases, realistically, anyone could create a user account and submit a test or upload existing results, although this does vary depending on the provider. In reality, no DNA company knows why you're interested in the genealogy of the DNA that you submit. Submitting a test with crime scene collected samples would oppose some additional challenges, but most genealogists know that if you already have your results, you can upload them to GEDmatch, which is a completely open and free DNA website database. And that's exactly what the investigators did. Thank goodness. Because once they got matches from a tree and scoured it, they found between two and five individuals in the tree that really fit the profile really well. And of the top two, they eliminated the first one and then turned their attention to Joseph James D'Angelo Jr., a 72-year-old, born in 1945, a former police officer in Northern California, and still living in the Sacramento area. DNA forensic investigator Paul Holes has said in interviews that the process took about four months from start to finish, 
from when the first match appeared on Jed Match to when D'Angelo was arrested. And then once they had identified D'Angelo, they still had the job of finding a discreet way to collect his DNA while he was under surveillance, and then running it through testing to find a match that could be pursued. And coming up next, I'm going to get back to that idea about how to find a family tree for a best DNA match who doesn't have a family tree. Have you heard about the great genealogy conference coming up in August 2018 in Arlington, Washington? Well, it's the fifth annual Northwest Genealogy Conference. It's hosted by the Stillaguamish Valley Genealogical Society that's just north of Seattle. Centering on the theme Beyond Your Family Tree, it's four days packed full of genealogy. Many topics will be explored, such as Swedish, Irish, and Italian research, immigration, migration, and unusual record sets, such as coroner's reports and patent records, just to name a few. There will be well-known and respected keynote speakers, including genetic genealogist C.C. Moore on Thursday, Peggy Lawrenson, A.G., on Friday, and Beth Folk on Saturday, as well as many other excellent speakers, such as Michael Strauss, who does the Military Minute segments right here on our podcast. The conference will start off with a free beginner class on Wednesday afternoon. Now, speaker Amy Bowser Tennant will present Let's Start Off on the Right Foot, which is also a really good refresher for the more seasoned genealogists. There'll be such great genealogical information for all levels, and it'll be lots of fun. Because between classes, you can take a chance to meet a distant cousin with the Cousin Wall and the Relative Finder app, participate in the scavenger hunt, the Wednesday evening meet and greet, and the Friday dress as your ancestor day, and much, much more. So go to www.nwgc.org. That's NW like Northwest GC.org for details and to register. Check it out now. Registrations are limited, so it's really a good idea to get in early. August 15th through the 18th of 2018. It's going to be a great show. Don't miss it. NWGC.org. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. I want to talk about the questions and ethics surrounding this case, because I know that's on the minds of many of you. I've been hearing from you. But I did promise you that I would come back to the idea that a tree can be found on genealogy websites, even if the match doesn't have a tree, or worse yet, is also using an anonymous username. This ties directly back to the presentation that I premiered at Roots Tech 2018, along with Diane Southard. It was called a DNA match with no tree, no problem. It addressed the number one frustration that anyone using DNA for genealogy faces, a viable DNA match with no tree. Now, I've been teaching family historians to use Google to find information on their family tree for 11 years now, and I've written a very popular book on the topic. 
But putting it together with DNA made this one of the most exciting things I've worked on in a long time. In the presentation, Diane laid out for the audience the brick wall that she faced in her family tree and the small number of anonymous matches that her DNA testing generated. And these were best matches, so they were worth pursuing. But none of them had trees. I remember when she called me up and told me that this was the case, and I said, let me have a shot at this. Let me use some other types of techniques, including using Google, and see what I can do. So in the presentation, I showed how to use Google search to interplay with DNA results to identify the user. And then, because they didn't have their own tree online, I set about finding them a surrogate family tree. Now, we cover the basic steps of the process in the DNA Quick Reference Guide. It's called Breaking Down Brick Walls with DNA. And you'll find that along with our other guides, including the GEDmatch Guide for Autosomal Testing in our Genealogy Gems online store at genealogygems.com. Now, we had a packed audience for that presentation, and the response was overwhelming. I'm very happy to say that the complete one-hour video of the presentation that we gave is now included in our Genealogy Gems Premium e-learning membership. So all of you Genealogy Gems members, I strongly encourage you to sit down and watch it. You're going to learn how to employ the same kinds of techniques that I'm sure that they use to find D'Angelo, except you're going to be finding your DNA match, and most importantly, your shared ancestor, thereby expanding, of course, your knowledge and your tree. It's been uh, very impressive to watch criminal investigators employ really a similar strategy in this notorious case. So now I can stop yelling at my TV screen. Genealogy has the answer. Coming up next, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room, privacy and your DNA. Okay, have you visited backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. So let's talk about that elephant in the room, privacy and your DNA. So here's the challenge. Isn't it nearly impossible to keep data private when you've put it online? And does putting it online constitute going public? I think it probably does. I don't know that it's realistic to expect privacy if you're out there putting things into public forums and databases. The only way that I know of to ensure privacy is to never put anything of any kind online. Just like the only way to ensure that you'll never be in a car accident is to never, under any circumstances, get in a car. To think otherwise is to sort of behave like the kids on the school ground. They'd spin around in a circle with their arms outstretched, sing-songing, if you hit me, it's your fault. If you hit me, it's your fault. Well, it's just not realistic to do something, but expect no consequences from it. So first and foremost, I'm a believer in personal responsibility. And that includes when we make the choice to submit our DNA to public forums and services that include connecting you with other people in the general public. Now, of course, there are certainly 
some ideal scenarios that we wish for and we strive for as a community, like where everyone asks permission, behaves respectfully, uses excellent judgment, has good intentions, and of course, is trustworthy. However, in the real world, you and I both know that that that's not always the case. So like when we drive, when we put our DNA into a database online in the public, we accept the risk of participating. So how does the Golden State Killer case, and specifically the investigators' use of a genealogy DNA database for a non-genealogy purpose, affect the genealogy community? Well, Paula in Canada was wondering about that when she wrote me this email. She writes, With the recent use of DNA sites to find the California serial killer, Joseph James D'Angelo, I was reminded of your Roots Tech presentation about using Google to fill in a family tree for someone without a tree listed. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how use of this technology for crime fighting will affect the public's attitude toward DNA testing. Not that I'm planning on becoming a mass murderer or I suspect any of my relatives to become one, but it raises some serious questions about privacy and alternate uses for this technology. It basically opens up access to find you through one of your many cousins, which you may not even know about once someone has collected some of your discarded DNA. I would be interested in knowing how law enforcement officers found his discarded DNA. We should all be careful of who is watching us, where we spit, or throw away our Kleenex. Well, these are great questions, and they are great points, and ones that really aren't that popular to ask or to mention. But I'm glad that Paula did. I've thought a lot about the ramifications of DNA testing over the years. In fact, ever since it first hit the genealogy world, But it's been clear to me since the beginning that in the face of all the DNA enthusiasm, you're not going to win a popularity contest if you bring up the possible downsides. So let's do that now. I think the Golden State Killer case has really opened that door and has really got the community at least now willing to think about it and talk about it. So let's break down Paula's questions and some of the other ethical questions all of this raises. So get ready, because coming up next, I'm going to hit you with some of my personal opinions on the subject. If you find yourself disagreeing, what I hope you're going to do is see this as an opportunity to think about it differently, maybe from a new perspective, and then consider doing your own homework and making the right personal decision for you. This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. Now, last year, I got a StoryWorth subscription for my dad because, well, he's a man of few words, and I really wanted to know more about his life than what he's already told me. Well, every week, he's gotten an email with a question about his life, and these come from StoryWorth. StoryWorth let me see the questions before he got them. I could skip any I thought weren't relevant, and I could add my own. He's replied to those emails with his answers. They're recorded by StoryWorth, and I've received copies, and I just love them. But he could have also called in to the StoryWorth number and recorded them. They've been short, of course. (laughs) That's my dad, but so precious. I've learned more about him in the past year than I probably have over my entire life. My dad has just finished his subscription, and soon I'm going to get to order the keepsake hardcover book that comes with it, which compiles all his answers into one volume. What a treasure that I will pass on to my daughters and my grandchildren someday. And as someone who cares about privacy and security, I appreciate knowing it's only for us. StoryWorth always keeps us in control of who actually sees his stories. For Mother's Day, I recommend StoryWorth. Even if you've already ordered flowers or another gift, StoryWorth tells your mom how much you care about her life. If you're shopping at the last minute, it's really an easy and thoughtful gift. And you know, it's the perfect thing for a parent who lives far away, like my dad does. It sure helped my dad and I bridge the geographic distance between us. Go to storyworth.com slash Lisa for $20 off when you subscribe. Give a gift for Mother's Day that's actually a gift for you too. That's storyworth.com slash Lisa. So 
So here are my thoughts on the use of technology for crime fighting and the effects on DNA and genealogy. Bottom line, let's just cut right to it. I think it's fair game for criminal investigators to use genealogy databases to match their samples. So why is that? Well, let's use online digitized newspapers as an example, and one that doesn't have as many emotions tied to it, because I think that does cloud our judgment. Let's say that the ABC newspaper company decided to digitize their newspaper collection 10 years ago. And the stated purpose of their company might have been to provide searchable newspapers to journalists who research for their stories. But soon, other people start requesting access to the online data. School teachers want to have access for their students. Authors want access for their research to write their next book. And of course, genealogists want access for family history research. Now, why would the ABC newspaper company restrict their subscription database to only journalists? And certainly, they wouldn't have the resources to personally interview each and every subscriber to ensure that they were, in fact, a journalist. Even if they did, the subscriber would not necessarily be always 100% truthful about their intention for using the database because, frankly... They don't understand why it's anybody's business, why they want to look at the newspapers if they're willing to pay the subscription fee. Who is the perfect judge of someone's intentions for using something that's publicly available or is available to you if you pay the price of admission? You can see the parallels here to DNA databases. No one's up in arms about the fact that non-genealogists can buy a subscription and look at the newspaper content at Ancestry DNA. So why would the DNA feature of the website be off limits? In fact, I want to stop and point out something that I think that we have to look at. There is, in fact, an online newspaper subscription site that experienced a very similar scenario as the one I mentioned. And the prudent business move that they made was to start creating different versions of their website. So each of them target a different niche audience who would have an interest in their database. So when you visit this genealogy-themed newspaper site, you don't have any idea that they have other sites out there owned by the same parent company using the same data, but marketing the database to teachers or journalists. I mean, for all we know, there's a version out there with a very nice user interface geared to criminal investigators. Who knows? The point is, it's not unheard of that a company discovers that their products have a farther reach than they first realized. And this means that your data and the company's data, all data, has dollar signs attached to it. And if you're a Genealogy Gems Premium eLearning member and you've watched the premium video take control of your family tree, then you know that this has already happened in the genetic genealogy world because I talk about that in that presentation Ancestry DNA and 23andMe have both discovered a lucrative market for the DNA data that their customers have paid them to process. And this is in the pharmaceutical industry. Like DNA results, your family tree information that you share online is also financially valuable to genealogy websites. And they are even more powerful when put together. They can and will use your tree and DNA data for their purposes within the terms of their service agreement. So companies sell aggregated data, including de-identified DNA test results to other companies, many of whom are interested in medical and pharmaceutical research. That's what they're interested in now. But remember, this is just a moment in time, and we are in the wild west of DNA and genealogy. So their interest in it might change in the future or Other industries may be interested in it as well. Both Ancestry DNA and 23andMe have these kinds of business partnerships, and I really encourage you to read Ancestry's Terms of Service to refresh yourself on what they can do with your information. And there was a really great article on this a while back at Wired.com of Wired Magazine. And in that article, they wrote about one partnership that Ancestry has with the Google-owned biotech company called Calico. Please remember, I'm not saying that this is bad or this is good. What I'm saying is, is that it's happening. And that means I want you to be aware of it. Because in the end, we are each responsible for doing our own homework and making an informed and conscious decision. 
if we choose to participate in DNA, then we have to know that this is happening. And I think that information is definitely power. Now, back to criminal investigations using genealogy DNA bases. Now, one could argue, but Lisa, DNA is more personal than the phone records that investigators get search warrants for that you talked about earlier. And you're right, it is very personal. Although I know a lot of people who feel like their phone records are intensely personal. But again, if you want to be private, you know what to do, right? You can't participate in whatever that public forum is. I don't know too many people who'd want to give up their smartphone. And there's a lot of genealogists who don't want to give up the benefits of genetic genealogy because of the possibility that their data may end up somewhere else. Coming up right after this, we're going to look in the mirror and I've got a couple of questions for you. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on MyHeritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at MyHeritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Now, I do have a question. Are we as genealogists doing the same thing that criminal investigators are doing? That is, sometimes using the genetic genealogy databases for other than building our family tree... When a genealogist takes a DNA test and adds their family tree to the online database, they're thinking about, hey, I want to get other genealogists out there to find and use this data and connect with them. I want best matches. But there are other ways these databases get used. Adopted children and birth parents trying to find each other. How about folks who are interested in locating estranged family members? Orphans trying to find long-lost siblings and relatives. And researchers seeking to identify unidentified human remains, including prisoner of war cases. There are many different ways that public DNA results are being used today that are not straightforward genealogy. We hear a lot of heartwarming stories about adoptees finding their bio parents or orphans locating their long-lost siblings. But the truth is, There are parents who sacrificed and gave children up for adoption so that they could have a two-parent home and a better life, and they want to retain their privacy. They may not want others in their family or social circle to know that they made that difficult choice when they were young. The truth is, not every story has a happy ending. Not everyone wants to be found. And in fact, I heard from someone the other day about how such a discovery nearly destroyed one family, and at a minimum, their relationships are never going to be the same. The daughter who found her birth mother through genetic genealogy announced it on Facebook and created unthinkable havoc for the birth mother, who was married and with children. It seemed a little odd to me that there hasn't been an outcry about the ethics of people using sites for ancestry for these other purposes, which sometimes do have a very negative consequence. But there has been for the use of these sites for catching a criminal, which last time I checked is a really good thing. For me personally, I have no problem with it. 
If I had a child who was murdered, I would move heaven and earth to find the killer. And if I had a serial killer in my family, I'd be the first one to volunteer to be tested and then secretly obtain their sample. I am no fan of evil. But can there be mistakes? Absolutely. But errors in conclusion can occur in all kinds of information and scenarios. I've heard it brought up that the Golden State Killers investigators had narrowed the possibility of suspects through the initial analysis of the family tree of the DNA match to the Golden State Killer sample down to two people, and they tested both of them. Now, it's kind of portrayed as if the other man was misidentified and accused wrongly, but really he wasn't. He was considered between two and up to five viable suspects, according to the news source that you read. And he was tested to prove or disprove the theory. He was not the Golden State Killer. And the other man was. Case solved. This happens all the time in criminal cases. And putting really bad criminals behind bars, I think is a very good thing. Paula did ask in her email about privacy and alternate uses for this DNA technology. Again, let's go back to reality and to truth. The reality and the truth is that genealogy databases of all kinds have been used by non-genealogists for non-genealogy purposes. We've talked about that. It's guaranteed. Their purposes just haven't been as in the spotlight as the investigators were. And yes, as Paula mentions, DNA opens you up to be found and secrets to be discovered. Can you imagine if genealogical DNA testing had been around in Hitler's day? I mean, think about that. And remember what I said, we would all enjoy the ideal scenario, the one where everybody asks permission, behaves respectfully, uses excellent judgment, has good intentions, and of course, is trustworthy. However, if like me, you live in the real world, you know, that is not always the case. And we don't know who's coming down the pipeline years from now, and what their intentions are. So I agree with Paula, think before you toss. In fact, insurance companies, if you think about it, when there's a case like an automobile accident, and somebody claims horrendous injuries, and they're wearing a neck brace, and there's a deep suspicion that this person isn't near as injured as they say they are, and they're asking millions of dollars, what does an insurance company do? They hire investigators who surveil the individual and take photos or video. So we know that that's already a tactic within an insurance company. And it made me wonder as I was writing this and thinking about talking to you about this today. I wonder, is this already happening? Is it happening that if somebody was looking for health insurance, and they wanted a huge amount of benefit for the policy? I mean, who's to say that somebody couldn't pick up a discarded napkin or drink, you know, a cup and get it DNA tested to see if that person has terrible genetic conditions and diseases in their family that would make them a really bad risk? I think that's a possibility. I wouldn't be surprised. I haven't heard of it, but I wouldn't be surprised. So let's talk about this idea that Paula brings up about the discarding of DNA and that maybe the police aren't the only ones who might pick yours up, right? That's absolutely true. In the case of the Golden State Killer, my understanding is that once they had narrowed down to him, and remember, this was through running the crime scene DNA profile through JEDmatch, receiving a best match, you know, whoever their best match was in the database, and then combing that matches tree for individuals who match the MO, the criminal profile of the Golden State Killer. And then they had to wrap this up by collecting the DNA of the individual at the top of the suspect list. And that was D'Angelo. By this point, they had already tested and eliminated the other viable suspect. So they were feeling pretty confident that D'Angelo was their man. So they didn't want to spook him. Collecting his DNA without him knowing it, of course, is the best way to do that. Well, waiters and waitresses pick up some of the best DNA samples on a daily basis. Anything with saliva on it. For all you know, any one of the waiters who have waited on you in the past could have had your DNA tested and run through a genealogy database under an anonymous username. 
Of course, I don't know that that would have happened. And it takes a bit of doing because the genealogy testing companies want you to submit the sample on the swab of their kit, right? Well, I can tell you from personal experience that this is not an absolute. Here's why. When my mother-in-law passed away a couple of years ago, we had not yet had the opportunity to test her DNA. My husband, Bill, her son, was agreeable to getting her tested. So I called the funeral home director and he had an innovative suggestion. He suggested that I go to my local CVS pharmacy and get a paternity test kit, bring it to him, and he would collect the sample post-mortem. And that's what we did. Now, initially, one of the major genealogy testing companies said, oh, we can't use that. We can't test that. It's not on our test kit. Now, the reason when I kind of press them on this is that they couldn't guarantee being able to accurately process results if it wasn't on their actual kit materials, the ones that they created. So I waived my rights to any guarantee, and I agreed that I was willing to receive no refund should the sample just not be viable for testing. I turned it in under an assigned kit number, and sure enough, we got excellent results. Because it really was just a swab in a test kit. It just happened to be somebody else's test kit. It was an unusual step to take, but worth it to us, as that was really our last chance to get my mother-in-law DNA tested. And in regards to privacy concerns, there have been a lot of news reports delving into the privacy concerns about investigators using public DNA databases originally designed for genealogy for criminal investigations. It's not that the investigators are doing anything wrong. It's just that we are in the wild, wild west, as I said, the pioneering years of DNA and genetic genealogy, and we're starting to see who else might be interested. We have been leaders in this. It's a little surprising, actually, that there hasn't been much, if any, conversation about this in the genealogy community so far. It's really been full steam ahead and a lot of enthusiasm. And I get that. There's a lot to be had from our DNA results. DNA sessions dominate genealogy conference schedules. And while you see the occasional ethics class, they're not really dealing, I don't think, with the full scope of what all of this means in terms of ethics. They tend to talk to the audience about their responsibility, you know, how they need to treat other people that they're testing and contacting people and that kind of thing. But it's so much more farther reaching than that. Insurance companies, employers, governments, educators, and many more could potentially have an interest in an individual's DNA for a variety of reasons. They're all in the public too. And I've been reading up on this. I found some news articles I think you'll find interesting. Here's one at news.com.au. And it says, quote, in Australia, life insurers are allowed to ask if an applicant is considering having genetic testing and then can use the results to determine their coverage, a decision not everybody thinks is fair. And in fact, it goes on to say, in China, by comparison, authorities have reportedly collected DNA samples from millions of residents for the purpose of surveillance. Scary. So I'm going to put this link in the show notes so that you can take a look at the full article. So we know that ethics goes a lot further than just our own behavior when it comes to our DNA testing and genetic genealogy. Do I think this is going to impact genealogists and, and other people testing, which of course grows the pool of results, which of course grows the accuracy and the information that's available. I think it could. My guess is it's going to be a temporary setback. I think in a way, like many things, it will blow over. But it may also end up stirring up all kinds of other things, including legislation or additional legislation. And that could more permanently change how DNA results are dealt with and how people feel about it. I think in the end, most genealogists who have tested, who know they are not serial killers, <laughs> feel pretty good about it. They feel okay about it because there are those benefits. And it's like getting in the car. And we know that when we drive, we take some risks, but we're willing to do it because there's a bigger benefit to us. And so I am fully, completely supportive of each and every one of you making your own choice and I don't think that it means that you're irresponsible to put it out there because it could be used in so many different ways. But I do think 
that I would hold you responsible for not complaining about it if you put it out there in a public area and find that it's more public maybe than you even thought. This is the early stages of all of this, and I hope that it can create conversation because I think conversation and information is power and it gives people an opportunity to really kind of fine tune the system. And I think that's probably most likely what we're going to see is some additional fine tuning of the system. And I think some just general acceptance of the risks we take when we do do our DNA testing. And I do think there will always be people who say, this is not for me, not going to happen. I am not putting it out there. And that leads me to my final thought, which is that no man or woman is a genetic island. And in reality, even those who have written, you know, the code of ethics for how to use DNA and privacy and ethics and all of that within the genealogy community, they're still kind of not looking at the whole picture. Every time one of us tests and turns in our DNA sample and adds our tree, we've just made a decision for everyone in our family. There is no way to make that DNA testing decision individually with no effect on anybody else. As I prove in the presentation that I gave, even a name, if you create a username that you think is secretive, that does not have your first and your last name, uh uh-uh, a little bit of good sleuthing can work around that and identify who you are in many cases, not all, but in many cases. So we have to be aware of that. I think that when we do our testing, We are putting the genetics of our children and our grandchildren and our great, 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 great. We're making decisions for people who are going to be born 30 years from now. We're making decisions for people who came before us because our DNA is their DNA. And so that's something to also keep in mind. In some ways, I think Pandora's box is already open (laughs) because we are all interconnected and interrelated. But it's an important thought to keep in mind that no man is a genetic island. And to keep that in mind as you move forward in your DNA research. And of course, for those of you who want to move forward and make the most of it and have done your testing or are going to do your testing, we're here to support you as well. I support each and every one of your own individual decisions. We have reference materials that are going to help you make decisions, use your results, get the most out of it. My goodness, you know, if you're going to jump in the car and drive, let's drive and get somewhere awesome. And that's exactly what our tools, our videos, our quick reference guides help you do. And for those of you who decide "Eh, DNA testing's not for me right now, boy, oh boy, here at Genealogy Gems, we have lots of other amazing resources for you to help you have success in many, many other ways in your genealogy journey. Because in the end, this is your journey. I want to thank you for listening to this special and kind of unique episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast today. It was poor Sunny. I had her organizing this whole different, you know, show. And I just switched it up on her because I just feel like this is an important burning question and conversation that needs to happen. And that's what we do is we move on a dime and make sure that we're addressing the things that are of the greatest interest and concern to you. I hope that you have found this thought provoking And I hope that if you are interested in commenting, uh, head over to the blog. We're going to be posting some blog posts on this as well. So you can certainly leave your comments there. You can also reach us through the contact form on our homepage at genealogygems.com to send us comments. And then we can share some of those in upcoming episodes, because of course, this is a conversation. Again, I feel like I went in 10 different directions, but that was really the nature of this topic. It was fascinating to me here. I thought I was going to do like a five or 10 minute segment and just kind of give an overview. And the more I worked on it and researched it and wrote about it, the more it just you know, the tentacles go out in all different directions. And you realize what a DNA web and a worldwide web this is. It touches so many areas and so many people. And so I think it's worth this dedicated bit of conversation and thought. I want to thank 
my wonderful team here at Genealogy Gems because uh, <laughs> they, they deal with me even when I switch gears on them. And that's Sunny Morton, our contributing editor, and, and Hannah Fullerton, who, <laughs> my wonderful daughter on the last second, uh, switched gears and edited this last minute recording for me. I do appreciate it. And of course, Lacey Cook, who um, keeps us all organized and together. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 